Hello, everyone, and welcome to When Tomorrow Comes. Um, this is our senior's regular look at the world of planning, development, and the built environment. My name's Dan Jestico. I'm director of Iceni Futures. And this week, we have some very, very special guests. We've got Adam and Jordan from Life Proven. How are you doing, gents? Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. Very well, Hello. thanks. How are you guys? Good, very well, thanks. Good to have you on board. And we're also joined by one of my senior colleagues, Jill Eaton. How are you, Jill? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me on, Dan. Nice to see you. <laughs> so, um, in these kind of dark January days of lockdown, we're all kind of thinking a bit more about what we want to do when we get outside, how we're going to make our lives a bit more healthy, a bit more gratifying. Um, and what better time to start thinking about health and well-being than by chatting to two um, experts in the field, Adam and Jordan from Life Proven. So, gents, tell me a bit about Life Proven and what you do and um, how it applies to built environment projects. Would you uh, like to kick us off, Jordan? Please take the honours. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, Dan, that would be a pleasure. So, um, yeah, I guess in, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell, Life Proven is, is a wellbeing property consultancy. Um, we founded two, three years ago in, in 2018. Um, and principally, we, we formed to provide um, a greater level of service and advice to our clients during the project management and cost management process to, to help them understand how their assets were impacting the uh, performance of their end users' health and well-being, but then also to, to guide them through the process to make more ethical and business-led development decisions. And this is something that we recognised was, was missing. Um, and that came to us through one or two, I suppose, relatively marquee projects where we were approached by the, the operational end user and also from, from um, through the university, taking a lease on a building, but then also uh, a tenant on a building who then raised with us that we, they were concerned around the way that asset had been created. And that just led us onto a journey of things can be done a bit better and, and we should really start to explore the end user as a, as a development objective and not just the cost and, and program and delivery. And that, that's kind of how we started. Can I just add to that quickly, Dan, if I'm allowed to take the microphone from you? Um, yeah, so j just to sort of underscore Jordan's um, overview of the, the issues, it was, it was effectively why we founded the wellbeing side of the business was almost a shortcoming in our own advice of an understanding of how the built environment impacts people's health and wellbeing. And when we were tasked to sort of enhance the health and well-being outcomes of the building at, at that time, we didn't really know what to do. Um, and the design teams didn't know what to do. It's like, where should we be investing um, our design and construction budgets to get the best sort of social value health well-being returns? And as project managers, quantity surveyors, we thought that was an enormous shortcoming that we didn't know where and what aspects we should be focusing our attention on as a design team to get those outcomes and how beneficial those outcomes for an end user would be. And obviously every, every property asset um, is only as good as the people that are in the building. And that's, that's why we build property. So it seemed a fundamental flaw in our sort of advice that we didn't understand that. So that's, that's the rabbit hole we decided to, to dive into to get a really in-depth understanding so we could help people, uh, both asset owners and end users. Okay, that sounds like an interesting start to the process. Um, taking a bit of a step back, Jill, um, surely health and well-being should be the fundamental cornerstone of our planning system. After all, you know, good town planning was founded um, by Ebenezer Howard back, way back when on the basis of kind of providing healthy towns for, for people to live in. Um, are we, are we, do we still have that at the core of the, the planning system? So it's very much moved away. The health and the planning system have gone off in two directions because back in 1948, uh, 1947, when the Planning Acts and the NHS were set up, they were very much intertwined. The planning system was bedded in sorting out the health conditions and problems that were arising. And, you know, they've obviously cantered off in the directions that they have. But um, at the moment, so many health professionals are looking to the planning system to see how health outcomes can be improved because you can't possibly fix everybody and address all the health problems through the NHS. It's got to be addressed more through lifestyles um, and the way people are living. So it really has counted off in two separate paths and it's very 
um, recognise now that the two need to be brought more together. Health professionals want to contribute more to the um, to ways in which the planning system can deliver better health outcomes. So it's it's a real sort of interest area and growth area, which is becoming more mainstream. And we've seen that through um, a number of you know webinars and discussions that have been taking place, particularly since COVID on this it's slap bang on the agenda as it as it should be and it probably shouldn't have deviated as much as it had it had done yeah that's that's, that's a really interesting sort of history of it all so Adam and jordan turning back to you guys um how how do we make sure that that we can deliver desired health comes desired health outcomes through good design practices i mean what what are the sort of key areas you guys are looking to focus on to improve um, operational health outcomes. Adam, you can take away. Um, to be honest, it's 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 quite challenging. Um, there wasn't so the sort of the reason why we had to do it ourselves is because we, we couldn't really find an, an industry standard that that was consistent across different tenure types. Um, so obviously, you've got health impact assessments, etc. But integrating that through a design and delivery team is, is, is very challenging. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's really why, why we founded what we're doing because the, the, the challenge is there's really great academic research on one arm for how buildings influence people's um, health and wellbeing over time. And then you've got design and delivery teams and there's an enormous gap between those two worlds. So trying to bridge that gap with really simple, direct, focused advice for design teams so they know what they should be focusing on, where they should be investing their money, and what the best outcomes are is sort of what we have been trying to achieve from setting up. Um, so sort of to come back to your question, there, there are other companies like Well, for example, uh, building, um, and it's, it's becoming a lot more topical, but it, it definitely is a an uphill battle to try and get that industry-wide understanding filtered through a design team from start to finish in an operation lane. So I might, I might pass to Jordan because I've probably gone completely off track there as to what sort of things we would actually do on a project um, to give you an understanding. Yeah, I think... As, as Adam said, that the, the approach we took is because the, the guidance in the industry, I think even, even now is, isn't very clear on what you need to do. But I think what's the way you, also that we're talking about it is that wellbeing is almost like a, a bolt on feature to design. And actually, you know, something that we've established is, is there is no um, tick box sheet for any type of building. Every building, every user is unique. And it's about understanding who your demographic is and what you're actually trying to achieve as your, your objective. You know, what's the long-term aspirations for creating this building? And, and there are some very simple factors to consider when creating a building. And we, we probably see it, you know, all the time now on LinkedIn around having access to green space, natural daylight, having a building which promotes, um, you know, physical activity. Um, having touches with nature, having resilient materials, but just by incorporating those doesn't mean that you're going to have a building which improves health and well-being. It's much wider than that, and it's about educating your your investors. It's about looking at educating your end users so that they know how that building's been created. But it's then also when we think about the part that Adam and I play in in the RBA stages, and and probably us as a as a team on this call, we're involved for such a short time of that assets life cycle that it's the the stewardship of that building that's most important and about making sure that that asset is going to respond now and into the future and that those residents are continually going to be um i suppose have their their, their well-being maintained and that comes through the operational stage and it's about understanding your your end users which is why we've taken a data science approach to how assets are actually working because they may work for the first five years of their life and then you might see a, a drop off and then you'd have to pick back up as to why is this not this not working. So there's some very key things that we can look at. But I would say, crucially, it's look at what's happening in property at the minute and what's impacting people. And sometimes it's something as simple as having bad interaction with neighbours, having poor acoustics by changing those two things in some assets is dramatically going to improve people's well-being outcomes. So 
Um, Can I just add yeah, a, a, a case study in there quickly, which might sort of summarize the, the high level theory we've just <laughs> run over. Sorry if we've gone in a completely different direction to your, to your question, but just to put that in context. So we, we work, do a lot of work with Horsham District Council um, and they have uh, a portfolio of temporary accommodation properties. So one thing that we're doing with them to help, uh, this is sort of merging the academic world, health wellbeing world, and then the actual property delivery world together is every six months we do a health and wellbeing survey of all of their residents. And then off the back of that, we, which obviously generates data. Um, and then we analyze the data across their whole portfolio to pinpoint in what buildings, what aspects of those buildings are positively and negatively impacting people's quality of life. And then we're using that data to inform uh, their regeneration program. So they know, okay, in each building, what, what areas and where should we be investing our, our renewals budget to get the best quality of life outcomes. And then once they make those works and they survey again six months later, they can actually quantify the quality of life impact of those decisions, uh, both yeah, financially and socially. So that's just one example of how um, I suppose we're, we're merging those two worlds together into a, a delivery service, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I just chip in. So just some observations from the Healthy City Design Conference. So I've attended the 2019 one and the 2020 one. And that was a massive takeaway from the first one that I had was there's all this absolutely phenomenal ac academic research happening on all these really relevant issues. But me sat here as a planner, you know, from either the local authority side or the planning consultant side, you know, it's just not getting through. How do we get these matters dealt with and considered in the day-to-day -day decision making in the built environment it's just it seems kind of ludicrous that it it's gone as far apart as it has all the silo thinking is happening to the extent it is and we really need to kind of bash heads together and um you know address this because it's we've seen how important it is to society and that it's such an ecosystem of people's health producing a strong economy and everything else, COVID highlighted that as if it, if it wasn't already apparent enough. Um, and I think the sort of deregulation that we've seen with permitted development, whereby housing has been created, which hasn't been of the quality that one would expect in this day and age, that's again highlighted the problems that those residents will be facing on health and wellbeing fronts, such as poor daylight, poor space standards, you know, maybe located in areas that aren't well suited to housing being former you know, industrial areas, for example. So I think it's shone a much stronger light on it. And, you know, we as built environment professionals should be using our voice strongly to see these matters addressed and changed. So I think there's a real opportunity and with the planning system being reformed to the extent it is, now is the time, you know, there's lots that can be done. There's lots with um, digital tools that are coming forward, you know, how data science can influence assess predict and then adapt policy this is a really strong opportunity jill you you, you kind of took the words out of my mouth with that one i mean the the the, 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 the thing point i was going to make was was really about collaboration because it's not like anyone sets out to to build something that is unhealthy or produces negative health outcomes you know people would be, be be really upset if they knew that something they'd worked hard on and designed led to that so I guess there's just a bit of a, a need for almost more collaborative thinking across the industry, whereas you might have a quality review panel or a design review panel. Why not have a health review panel that actually looks at kind of, you know, designs at fairly early stages in the process to say, look, let's work collaboratively across, uh, collaboratively across all different disciplines, especially the key ones like you know, air quality, transport, green space, architecture, um, and to, to, to come up with solutions. And a lot of these solutions don't necessarily need to be complicated. It might be, as Adam and Jordan pointed out, something quite as simple as soundproofing and just making sure that people get a decent night's sleep when you might have noisy neighbors or something like that. So I mean, is, is, is collaboration to your minds, um, and this is a, a, a kind of a question for everyone, how do we get more collaboration in the system to overcome some of the barriers that we're experiencing with regard to, to, to wider implementation of, of the health and wellbeing agenda. 
Who wants to start on that one? Like, I'll chip in with a few thoughts. So we've seen how sort of heritage has come, you know, slap bang into the agenda over the last 20 years. You know, 50 years ago, whatever, we were demolishing fantastic manor houses. And, you know, the, the system's adapted and changed. We now know we need the right professionals advising on the right kinds of projects. It seems to me that there's a good model there for how health and well-being can step up to the plate in the planning remit. So, for example, you could have um, the way we consult with Historic England on a planning application. You could have a, a statutory consultee advising on health matters for planning applications. And then you could have policies in your MPPF, which filter through to your local plans on health and well-being considerations. So there's, you know, there's. It's good to see well what mechanisms have we already got that work and how can we um, dovetail health and well-being into that and from some of the conversations we've had on the back of previous webinars with public health england and the health and well-being planning network it seems that health professionals are just so maxed out they haven't got the resources to be commenting on you know consultation papers so we need to upskill people we need to probably do more training between planning and health professionals so that those people are in posts in say local authorities or a statutory body filtering through this because the outcomes could be really you know fantastic but it's just working out the tools for how we could do it yeah i'll, I'll, I'll just add to that because that's a that's a fantastic i suppose the top-down approach by getting policy in line um, that everyone needs to then follow, which, yeah, which would be a very quick um, solution for like a, a blanket solution for the whole industry. Another approach could be the, the bottom up approach, which is what we've always um, been trying to advocate is just educating the end user, because once the, the mass market understands how a building, a home and office impacts their health and well-being, they're going to be banging on the door to make sure the buildings they buy, that they rent, are beneficial for them. And I think that's probably one of the, the, the biggest challenges, but also opportunities. And I think it's people are becoming more and more aware um, of it. So that's going to slowly turn the tide that property professionals will then realise like, right, OK, we're getting it from a policy perspective. And then also the end users are now demanding it because they're more educated, they have a better understanding, this has to just become our standard practice. And then that will sort of hopefully transition the industry to, to putting health and well-being at yeah, more of a focal point through the design process. Yeah, and I think we are seeing that. So I think yeah. local communities, when you do neighbor consultation and engagement exercises, that's you know, it's a big issue for them. They're mm. interested in it, no matter what sort of demographic profile they're in. I think councillors are interested in it. So you might not have to assess health and well-being as a part of a planning application, but councillors are interested in how this development integrates with their community in terms of health outcomes. So I think you're right. I think it has to be both. Yeah. Um, and looking at the benefits of doing both as well, because engagement is so critical and most people can directly relate to their own health and the health of their family and loved ones. So, you know, you've got buy in straight away for the concept of the whole issue. Yeah. And, and just to take that from an, an alternative industry, if we look at like the, the food industry, for example, um, before nutritional labels were invented, people used to eat anything and they'd get scurvy and get sick and die. Uh, not knowing how food was impacting their their physical health uh, and mental well-being, but then through innovation research that slowly transitioned into yeah mass market education, and people could now pick up a sandwich from Pret and look at the label and know exactly how that's going to impact them. And that that sort of process is happening through property, but it's not at the the level that it is in the nutritional world yet. But it, it will get there, and then at, at that point the sort of tide will turn. Yeah, I think something that we we've certainly seen as well, which probably comes at it from a from a different angle, is we've just seen the change this year from how properties have, have performed through some difficult times and and just the the ESG directive and just the investors um, criteria to to understand how their assets are working socially and and ethically, and I think that there is a business case behind creating assets which improve people's health outcomes, and and there is a there's definitely a, a trend towards that and that will only continue. But um, I guess the 
the, the capitalist part of property is that if if your properties are separated from the market and they have a genuine USP, that, that those will become in demand and that they, they will go quicker or be occupied quicker and people want to use them. So there will be, I think, a, a trend in movement, especially in the recovery from this year. I think those properties which display and can demonstrate how they how they are resilient from pandemics or improve lifestyle behaviors, I think there was naturally going to be be in demand. And I think that will only just help shift the market to where it needs to be. And I think incorporating all of those things will will, will slowly show some some collaboration. And I think it's a fine balance between consumer sentiment, you know, directive from from investment. It is policy driven. And if all of those come together, then it will it will truly work. And I think that's something we're we're seeing i think we're, we're optimistic that that's that's going to happen so yeah i think a key thing is to watch out for the rush to address covid causing a dumbing down because the last thing we need is a dumbing down we need to keep sustainability and climate change slap bang on the agenda together with health and well-being and actually it's got some of the solutions it shouldn't be seen as a barrier or another thing to do actually this is a central concept that can um, you know, it needs to be taken into account, not just as a tag on, as we've previously said. So I think there's a, there's a bit of danger in the government's rush to address what has been, you know, a phenomenal situation that we don't lose sight of how critical climate change, sustainability and health and wellbeing is. Absolutely. OK, um, we, we, we are running out of time a bit. So I want to finish off with um, one final question or one final point is, is how do we how do we display this data? I mean, Adam and Jordan, I know you you do quite a bit of work with post occupancy evaluation, but how do you see? You know, you mentioned a sort of equivalent of a nutritional label. How do you see a sort of building a consistent structure for assessing health and well being across the industry, maybe across different sectors like resi, um, commercial, retail, industrial. How do you see a sort of framework like that working and what sort of data would you envisage it, it being able to display? Um, yeah, just a, just a, some, some quick thoughts on that one to wrap up. Very, very quick. I'll, I know Adam's going to jump in as well, but, but something that we see is a steer away from tick box approaches in, in saying this building has met these criteria and therefore it, it's a healthy building. I think we see a, a journey in, and a transition towards buildings which are providing live reporting feedback both in terms of how that's operating from a uh, efficiency from an energy perspective but then also from an occupant perspective and I think it's crucial to continually monitor and understand how that building's operating and it's about understanding the property type or the property that that's in front of you it's not under, it's not about scoring a building to say this building meets these objectives and it scores 80 out of 100 that doesn't tell you anything but if you could if you could have a building passport that told you this building is performing in these factors and it's not performing here and you can use some robust and reliable methods through through data science which is the approach that we take it's objective and it can be relied upon so i think there's a it's a it's probably using building technology one step further yeah you i think you slam dunk that um so i probably don't need to I'll see if i can add anything yeah so just, well i'll expand on it very quickly um, yeah, so it's all about, from our perspective, is post-occupancy evaluation, but not just a one-off and not just a survey, it is in-depth data science analysis to quantify how that, that specific building or that built environment is impacting people's quality of life. And that is the only measure to actually, of, of the true performance success. And then using that data to A, understand how that design, how that fit out has impacted people. And then using that data as an evidence base to make the next sort of evolution of design decisions from. So if we, we've built a building, we analyze it, we then have that data to tell us what's working, what's not, using that as the foundation for our next, our next development. And then as we do that across more properties, more property types across the world, or the UK and the world, we'll start to have a, a bigger and bigger evidence base and it will I suppose the yeah, decisions will become more accurate, similar to what they are in the nutritional world. Okay. Um, thank you very much, gents. Um, and thank you very much, Jill. Uh, it's been really, really fascinating talking about this with you. Um, and yeah, as ever, 
um, it's, it's brilliant sort of collaborating and hearing ideas about how our industry can kind of come together to to actually solve problems that really should we should be dealing with anyway. So, um, you know, I hope um, we all get the chance to, to collaborate on, on projects in future, both for public and private sector. Um, I'd like to thank our audience for, for tuning in, for watching. Um, see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Thanks Jill. Dan. Thank you all. See you. Bye.